Good afternoon. This is not the first time I have engaged with Avoda. I've worked with Chris on some other things and just made some reacquaintance with some people that I met in Austin a few years ago. They had a wonderful group of educators and people of influence talking about how to move forward with this civics idea, the idea of teaching our children who they are and where they fit as citizens in our country. So it's really terrific for me to have this opportunity to speak with you educators, uh, people of influence. I think when I speak with teachers, I'm hoping that the effect is multiplied because you then go out and speak to other teachers, but more importantly, you then do uh, engage with our next generation of citizens. So it's really an honor for me to be here today in keynote. Um, the education of young people to assume their role as citizens in a democratic society is the central mission of our schools. Uh, the primary impetus for establishing the public school system was to educate a diverse American population into a literate and informed citizenry. Uh, in his farewell address, President George Washington argued for the creation of, and I quote, institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge in a democratic society. It is essential that the youth of our country understand this and have the proper, proper knowledge, skills, and dispositions of effective citizens. As teachers, you understand this. It's important that at every level we explore the principles of the rights and responsibilities and the role of an active citizen. I commend ABOTA for their work in this area and the National Constitution Center for their leadership in the study of the Constitution. If I had only had their interactive Constitution app when I was in school. Education about the rights and responsibilities of citizens in our constitutional democracy and education about the rule of law is essential to the preservation of our democracy. Our forefathers understood the crucial role that education of the citizenry would play in keeping our country safe and free. Thomas Jefferson wrote to a colleague, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. He emphasized that point again in the notes on the state of Virginia, declaring, every government degenerates when trusted to the rulers. The people themselves, therefore, are its only safe depositories. And to render even them safe, their minds must be improved. The development of the American public school system in the 19th century was based on the vision that all education had civic purposes and that every teacher was a civics teacher. Civics education is important not only for the substantive content-based knowledge, but also the development of skills necessary for adult citizenship, critical thinking, problem solving, and informed participation. Such skills transfer to all subjects, but more importantly, they transfer to life, to be productive, active citizens and workers. In the judiciary, I see the consequences of a lack of civic education every day. The lack of understanding of, and at times lack of respect for the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary makes me doubly concerned about the state of civic education. A survey released on Constitution Day by the Annenberg Public Policy Center graphically reveals the sad state of affairs regarding civic knowledge of our citizens. 26% of those surveyed could name three branches. In 2011, 38% could. 31% of those surveyed could not name one. Nearly four in 10 said the Constitution gives the president the power to declare war. Well, it doesn't. Only one half knew that this power is reserved for Congress. When I was in school, civics was taught by way of memorization. Our civics book was like a catechism with Q&A. How many branches? What do we mean by separation of powers? Today, our students want relevant interactive learning, and our standards aim at the depth of learning, not just rote memorization. We need to make our students think yet are unsure as to the curriculum that can accomplish this. I suggest matching topics of interest today with court cases that can be current but need not be. We all know that Brown versus Board of Education established the principle that separate but equal doesn't really work in the school setting. But how many of us truly appreciate that the concept of equality, which we grapple with even today, perhaps more today than ever, has been developing as long as our country has existed. And while it is taken for granted as a hallmark of America, 
It was truly unique when our founding fathers decided to separate from gentrified society of Great Britain. Yet in the case that heralded separate but equal, as permissible, Plessy versus Ferguson decided in 1896, in which the Supreme Court upheld a Louisiana law requiring separate but equal railroad cars for, quote, colored people, end quote. We have a spirited dissent from Justice Harlan. I must note that I was unaware of this dissent until recently when I was helping a young student from the Constitutional High, Constitution High School, which is nearby here, prepare his 10-minute preparation for National History Day. It was a rap soliloquy focusing on the fallacy of equal education in America. And he quoted from Harlan's dissent in rap. It was so moving as it meant so much to him. And I quote from just a few passages. But I deny that any legislative body or judicial tribunal may have regard to the race of citizens when the civil rights of those citizens are involved. Indeed, such legislation as that here in question is inconsistent not only with that equality of rights which pertains to citizenship, national and state, but with the personal liberty enjoyed by everyone within the United States. And he continues, but in the view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. It is therefore to be regretted that this high tribunal the final expositor of the fundamental law of the land has reached the conclusion that it is competent for a state to regulate the enjoyment by citizens of their civil rights solely upon the basis of race. And he ends by saying, I think poignantly, in my opinion, the judgment this day rendered will in time prove to be quite as pernicious as the decision made by this tribunal in the Dred Scott case. Rather prophetic. And we continue to struggle with what equality means, what it demands in our hearts and in our minds. Similarly, the teaching of Korematsu has relevance today. When confronted with the fear of suspect categories, the Supreme Court, by a vote of six to three, approved the exclusion from the Pacific area of all persons of Japanese ancestry, alien and non-alien. And I quote, when under conditions of modern warfare, our shores are threatened by hostile forces, the power to protect must be common, commensurate with the threatened danger, end quote. That would, I believe, be a good starting point for a discussion of the lengths to which government can go to protect against terrorism. It suggests meeting terror with terror. Yet it was clearly racist, as the dissent noted, that this exclusion under the mantra of military necessity goes over, and I quote, the very brink of constitutional power and falls into the ugly abyss of racism. Do we see similar situations today when attacks are leveled at Muslims because they are Muslims and therefore suspect? Justice Black, in writing for the majority in that case, did say that these types of different treatment must be subjected to rigid scrutiny, but he concluded that this test was satisfied as to the Japanese given the World War. More recently, the Supreme Court in 2004 in Hamdi versus Rumsfeld gave meaning to the due process rights of those held by the government as enemy combatants. Did it take till 2004 for us to recognize this? These are evolving principles. Lastly, I was we're so concerned with the limits of presidential power in recent months and years. The Nixon tapes decision of 1974 provides a readily understandable curriculum on this topic and separation of powers generally. During the congressional hearings on the Watergate break-in scandal, it was revealed that President Nixon had installed a tape recording device in the Oval Office. The special prosecutor in the case wanted to get the tapes from the Oval Office to prove that Nixon and his aides had abused their power and broken the law. But Nixon claimed executive privilege. The lower court ordered the president to respond to all of the special prosecutor's requests. In front of the Supreme Court of the United States, Nixon's lawyers argued that the case couldn't be heard in the courts because it involved a dispute within the executive branch and based on separation of powers, the judiciary should not interfere. 
Well, in a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court ruled that the executive privilege was not absolute. And it rejected the argument that the separation of powers uh, caused this not to be just justiciable, saying that the case raised a constitutional question and therefore clearly fell within the functions of the judicial branch as interpreter of the Constitution. In fact, then, the court upheld the concept of separation of powers. So the idea that using court cases in your classroom as a teaching aid is not limited to school speech cases, and I know you've heard something about them today. But other cases can make current topics come alive. And it's important that you need not go this route alone. Lawyers would love to come in and help you instruct your classes as to these areas of the law. And I encourage you to reach out to ABOTA and to your local bar associations to enlist their aid. I'm convinced that discussing court cases can bring the Constitution to life for students as well as develop critical thinking skills. And teaching our young citizens about the way our courts function can be a wonderful first step. At the Rendell Center, we've do, been doing work with elementary schools and literature-based mock trials. We work with the teacher and the class to help them write a fact pattern and a script for a mock trial from opening statements, cross-examination questions, to closing statements. The trial is based upon a work of literature that the students are reading during the year. A literature-based mock trial provides a dynamic opportunity for developing higher level thinking skills as well as reading, writing, listening, and speaking skills, which provides a vehicle for increasing knowledge of our legal system. Our pilot school has seen significant increases in their English language arts test scores since a, a school-wide implementation of a literacy mock trial. I have overseen and presided at some of these mock trials, and the, the children really get involved. They, they learn about the characters, sometimes they they dress up. We did one with fantastic Mr. Fox, and Mr. Fox had fox ears and a tail. Um, and I've learned from the teachers that sometimes the children who are the, who are the quietest and perhaps the most challenged actually volunteer to play some of the roles. So it's really making our education go across uh, the whole class, not just the ones who might viscerally be the ones raising their hands. We've done mock trials on Goldilocks, the Lorax, Hoot, and the Giver at all ranges in elementary school. It's an excellent way to enhance the student's understanding while at the same time providing a fun, experimental learning experience. There's nothing more powerful than to see a young fifth grader cross-examining Goldilocks. Was she guilty of criminal trespass? Or a high school student passionately presenting arguments to a Supreme Court as they argue a current version of Korematsu versus the United States. Lawyers and judges are available in your community, as is the Rendell Center, to assist you with this process. And I encourage you to go on our website, uh, rendellcenter.org, and see what we have there in terms of curriculum and uh, a total explanation of what we do with our literature-based mock trial. We have a teacher's guide to how to do a literature-based mock trial. So I hope you will take what you've learned here and apply it in your classroom. We need to inspire and educate the next generation to ensure they have the knowledge and skills and dispositions of effective citizens. In closing, I'd like to leave you with a story which illustrates why an understanding of our democracy and the rule of all law is so essential, but so often is taken for granted. And some of you who've heard me speak before no doubt have heard this story because it just brings it home to me. Former United States Supreme Court Justice David Souter tells a story of a Russian lawyer who came to the United States and wanted a tour around the Supreme Court. So Justice Souter volunteered to take him around and was showing him around the Supreme Court building. And it became apparent that the Russian lawyer knew a lot about Supreme Court cases and Supreme Court precedent. So Justice Souter asked him, how is it that you know so much about our opinions? And the lawyer said, well, during the Cold War, now sometimes I need to explain that, what that was and my law clerks are here, maybe I need to explain to them, but most of you know what the Cold War were. We lived through the Cold War. During the Cold War, uh, when one of my lawyer friends would get one of the opinions of the Supreme Court, we would get together clandestinely and discuss it. And uh, Justice Souter found that really interesting. So the Russian lawyer asked him, Justice Souter, what do you think is the most important Supreme Court decision of the modern court? 
And without hesitation, he said, as most of us probably would, Brown versus Board of Education. Well, he could see that the Russian lawyer was disappointed in this and probably didn't agree. So Justice Souter said, OK, what do you think is the most important decision? And he said, the Nixon tapes decision. Because in my country, the thought that the court could tell the president what to do is unheard of. And Justice Souter, who had been a state court judge, a judge on the uh, Supreme Court, been a lawyer, he said at that moment he had an epiphany. He said, we don't teach civics. We don't teach our children the appreciation of our form of government. We have this government that does have the separation of powers, that does say to the executive, no, you need to obey the Constitution. And we don't realize that it's unique. Again, the issue of equality. When we came from, from Great Britain, equality? I don't think so. It was all about money and who your parents were and how much property you had. And you come to the shores of the United States and we pursue happiness and we want equality, it's really quite unique. But we go about our daily business, our jobs, just thinking, oh, well, we live here and that's fine. Only when I was overseeing a naturalization ceremony did it really hit me as to what we have in America. Looking out, a group much like yourselves, but then again, not like yourselves, 90 people from 29 different countries, the joy on their faces was just inspiring. And I realized they know what's important about America, but sometimes we do not. I just testified in uh, Harrisburg on Monday because there is a House bill, uh, 1858, where it is proposed that as part of your high school graduation, you should have passed, with a 60% passing rate, the 100 question test that immigrants have to pass. And I testified that we should be ashamed of ourselves if we think that this is a bad idea. This is not rocket science. This is a start. This is basic. Uh, it is, some people say, you know, an add-on or a, you know, another high-stakes test, if you will. But I submit that in this day and age, the students really can do it themselves. They could take the test any time over the four years. Um, and there can be exceptions for different situations. The school districts can tailor it. But I really think when we have statistics that I've quoted to you today, where nearly a third of our country cannot name a single branch of government, we really need to do something. They are our future. They are our government. They are our electorate. And we need to let them know that it's really important that they have basic understanding of facts and even more, that they know how to engage, how to vote, how to think for themselves. Because democracy of the few is not democracy. And we cede our power to the few. We are doing something that the Founding Fathers would not appreciate. So thank you very much for letting me speak to you today. I am so happy that you're here learning all about uh, our history and civics. And uh, I encourage you when you go out to, uh, to spread the word. Thank you very much. I would be pleased to entertain a few questions if we have a little bit of time. I'm Stephanie. Um, I work at the Iowa Department of Education. Um, I, I just wanted to, I guess, ask about uh, the particular piece you just talked about with the citizenship test. That same bill has come up in Iowa the past two years, um, and it has been defeated for two years. Um, our, our issue when it, when it comes up is not necessarily a disagreement with um, the idea. But several of our legislators um, believe that, that that is sort of a stopping point, that if that passes and if students take that um, exam, that they will sort of be good to go. Yeah. Um, and so my concern, just from my position, is really promoting the action side of civics, the engagement side mm -hmm. of civics. And so how do we get people to not only embrace some basic concepts and basic knowledge, mm -hmm. Um, but also really invest in um, the, instead of moving civics from the nice to know mm -hmm. um, into the, this is critically important yeah. for, for life. Well, I think some of the teachers who have uh, spoken to the, and I'll say it's been passed in 14 states and is now being considered in 22 
states. Uh, and the governors of Kansas, I think two of the governors are actually going around and actually lobbying for this. And I think it, it's a starting point for conversation. Uh, if there is any conversation in the schools about civics, that's fine, but we're finding that there really isn't much conversation. So it's a starting point for conversation and for action and gives the teachers an opportunity and the students an opportunity to then delve further. If they don't know a question, they can Google it and learn. And they're not just learning the answer to the question, they're learning all kinds of other things. Um, several years ago, Senator Byrd proposed that if any institution gets federal funds, they need to do something for Constitution Day. Well, there was pushback. You know, why do we have to do this? Well, it turns out that really has spurred a lot of activity on Constitution Day and a lot of conversation and a lot of op-eds about it and a lot of programs that make us focus on the Constitution. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, you can say, oh, well, it's the end and that's, that's all, but I think it's going to spur conversation and make the, make the teachers focus on it. And, and the children will report, well, I passed this part, and the teacher can, can do it the way that she wants. One of the teachers in ninth grade says she already uses it as a diagnostic tool in the beginning of the, of the school year, has the kids take the test, and then uses it again at the end of the year, and see, sees, well, have I made some progress? Have I taught them a few things? Uh, but you're right, it needs to be combined with action. There is no doubt. But when we're focusing so much on, on STEM, uh, and where social studies really isn't given the priority that we think it has. It's a, and the fact that we are having this buzz around it, and most people I talk to say, well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer that people should be able to do that, yet, yet they can't. We don't have the basic knowledge. But I agree, action and uh, you know, things of that kind, getting kids to be active is terrific. But you're always going to find that there's going to be that top 5 or 10% who will be active, who are already inclined my point is each child by name. And in, in mock trial, when we get those youngsters who aren't you know, raising their hands and they want to do something, uh, it's, it's that. I want, I want the voting population to be 100%, not the, the 20 or 23% who have an inclination. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of yay and nay about it. Uh, but, but I just think it's, a, it's almost like a starting point rather than an end. Yes. Need your track shoes. Oh, that's a good question. I, you know, I do think Nixon tapes is really kind of interesting. I mean, it was really a, uh, you know, really important time in our history, uh, and I think. Another thing that, that uh, Justice Breyer said after uh, the uh, Cooper versus Aaron, when the, you see the child being led into school by a marshal, and he said, you know, you see that child being led into school by a marshal. Everybody got up the next day and went to work. Everybody got up and said, the court has ruled. We will do what the court says. And I think that respect for law that we have in this country is huge. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor likes to say that the law isn't in the courts. The courts are there only for those three or four percent where somebody's not obeying the law, somebody doesn't know what the law is, we have to enforce the law, there's a disagreement about the law. But the other 97 percent of the law in our country is as we live and breathe. We are an amazingly law-abiding citizen. And I, I think it's that rule of law which I'm privileged as a federal judge to live and breathe. Uh, and it amazes me. It amazes me how our judges do the right thing in, in terms of the law. Now, I will say at the Supreme Court level, it's totally different. They get the puzzles. They need to decide what the law is. But even there, people say the Supreme Court is very politicized. You know, there's the, the liberals and the conservatives and the R's and the D's. But I say, you know, as I get up in the morning, am I going to see things differently than someone like Sam Alito, who was a lifetime prosecutor and who had a different upbringing than I had? I probably am, because my life experiences and my, the views that I've come to, to believe in over time uh, are firmly held, but are a product of my experiences. He is the product of his experiences. So, you know, we say it's political. 
Uh, but you know, you and your neighbors disagree about something. It's because they view things differently uh, just because of their experiences. You know, someone sees a youngster, a, a, you know, a young girl, let's say a 10-year-old girl, walking down the street during the day. And somebody's going to say, oh my goodness, somebody could kidnap her. Someone else will say, well, that's nice. She must have a day off. Someone else will say, where are her parents? I mean, we have reactions to things that are a product of who we are. They're not controlled by, well, that's a Republican view or a Democratic view. I, I believe. I believe they're all firmly held. So I think any, any case that really speaks to the rule of law, and I do look at, at Cooper v. Aaron, and I look at uh, Brown versus Board of Education. I mean, Brown versus Board of Education, when you read the first uh, uh, notes from the first conferencing on that case before the, the, the composition of the court changed and it, became, it was a unanimous decision, I ask people, I say, Brown versus Board of Education was 5-4, and everybody says yes. No, it wasn't. It was a unanimous decision. But the first conference in that case was, what are we going to do? Can we really upset the whole education system in the United States? And by the time of the second conference, they said, you know, Justice Harlan was right. Separate isn't equal. And we need to say that. And Justice Warren worked on it being a unanimous opinion exactly for that reason, the rule of law, so everyone would get up the next day and go about their business. I mean, even Bush v. Gore, and I would say that's not an opinion to be studied. Because <laughs> it kind of makes you crazy, all the different views. But Bush v. Gore, we got up, and everybody accepted what the court said. That doesn't happen in every country. And we don't have, they don't have judicial independence. I have a, I have a job for life or bad behavior, death or bad behavior, whichever comes first. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and that's one of the things, if you read the Declaration of Independence and then the Constitution, it will be striking how what we did in this country and establishing this country was a rejection of everything they did in Great Britain. Uh, I mean, King George used to dock the pay of the judges when he didn't agree with them. Well, our Constitution says our compensation shall not be reduced. If I do something that's unpopular, too bad, too bad. Yes, there was another. Yes, maybe this is the last one. Um, first of all, thank you for your keynote. I'm hoping there's a copy that will be made available so we can take it back to our states and cite portions. All right. Um, that, that's, I guess I could put that in the form of a question, but I really do have a question. Okay. Um, I looked, and you have background in bankruptcy. I do. Not and that I'm, I've been there. No, no. <laughs> Thank you. That was my legal practice. <laughs> yes. And so I'm wondering if you can recommend a court decision that could help students dig mm. deeply to see bankruptcy as both a protection for citizens and also not a dodge for wealthy businesses to, wow. I mean, is there a court case yeah. that could let them see complexities let in the Let me think about that types? because most of them would be the complexities that, because the bankruptcy has its own language. And it's very difficult, sometimes even for practitioners to, to kind of get through the, the uh, but, well, John's Manville was an interesting one. That's jurisdictional. Let me think about that, and I'll include that uh, in the copy of my remarks that I sent to Aboda. Right. But I think maybe articles. There would be uh, probably better if I would cite some articles that would be helpful. But, you know, when I first started bankruptcy law, it was not a very uh, sophisticated practice, but it then became a business strategy uh, and it has become a business strategy in the Chapter 11 context, but in the Chapter 7 and 13 context, it's still available to the, to the little guy. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, and enjoy your day. Thank you.